infinite that our Bibles are from God. Um, to frame the importance of our discussion tonight, I want us to consider that Scripture is the primary means by which we hear from God. And so mistrust in our Bibles, even a little bit of doubt about them, um, can prove an obstacle to our faith. Um, so consider 2 Timothy three fourteen through 16. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So recognizing the importance of scripture, let's consider carefully why we have confidence in it. This investigation was very enriching for me personally. I hope it will also be for you if you are a Christian. And if you are not, I hope it will help you seriously consider um, the quality of the reasons we have as Christians for what we believe. In particular, today I want to discuss the New Testament canon. Now, canon is a transliteration from Greek, which means literally a rule or standard for testing straightness. Um, but by the 4th century, Christians would use this term to refer to the sacred books that God had divinely inspired and given to humanity. I'm going to lay out a canonical model, um, a theology for how we know what books come from God. Um, in particular, the model which Michael Kruger advocates in this book, Canon Revisited. After outlining the model, we'll dive into the three attributes of canonicity that it includes, uh, and then look at a little example book, kind of evaluate Second Peter, and apply the model to it. And I'll also be stopping at various points for questions, discussion, or even criti criticism of the model. So if you have anything that puzzles you, take note of that, and there will be pauses to answer that and discuss whatever thoughts you have. Okay. So in Hebrews 6, it says that when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. It says that when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable nature, character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. Now, what does this mean? Normal people, in order to provide assurance that what they're saying is true, swear by something greater than themselves. But there's nothing greater than God. Does that mean he can't assure us? Um, no, because he, supreme in his authority, can and has encouraged us by swearing by himself. And so, sort of relatedly, if God has given us scripture as the highest authority for truth, then where could we learn to authenticate the canonical books except from the pages of Scripture itself? So when we say that we can, so that we can then rightly say, reasonably say, that Scripture is self-authenticating, the canon is self-authenticating. Um, and we don't just mean by that that Scripture claims to have authority. Of course, there's lots of religious books that do that. We don't just mean even that it has internal evidences of its authority, um, but that the text itself directs us in how to authenticate the canonical books. Like I said, the words of scripture itself guide and determine how its own authority is to be established. <coughs> so, diving into the model. What the first step is to identify what books are actually legitimate candidates for evaluation. Um, in 1 Corinthians 5.9, Paul refers to this previous letter, notice 1 Corinthians, that he had written to this church. Um, and it's a question for us. If we were to find this lost book in the sands, would we have to add it to our Bibles? It was written by Paul, by an apostle. Um, but I'll contend that the first major class of books that are excluded from the New Testament are those books that were lost or otherwise not exposed to the church as a whole. You may recall that God says of his word in Isaiah 55, 10 through 11, For as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. 
God has worked by his providence in the copying and sharing of scriptural books to ensure that the canonical books are exposed to the church as a whole. So if a book was lost to history, that is good evidence that God did not intend for it to become part of the canon. This helps us understand how we should regard, for example, Paul's original pre-1st Corinthians letter to the Corinthian church. Um, And as you can already see, this model rests to a tremendous degree on this prior trust in God's activity. Um, But the main main framework of the model, and where we'll spend most of our time this evening, are the three attributes of canonicity. These are characteristics that differentiate the New Testament books from all other books. It's important to remember these aren't expectations that we've brought to the text from ourselves, but rather attributes we derive from God's word, and then use to authenticate which books should be part of it, the Bible. Um, So first, canonical books have divine qualities. They bear the marks of divinity. These include beauty, effectiveness, slash efficacy, and unity. And we'll dive into all these details a lot more shortly. Um, And second, canonical books come from apostolic origins. They're the result of the unique redemptive historical activity of the apostles, a group of men appointed by Christ and equipped by the Holy Spirit to lead the early church. Thirdly, canonical books are corporately slash collectively received. They're recognized by the church as a whole. But a lot of us, especially maybe from Protestant backgrounds, might hear that and say, how can we be confident that the church as a whole will rightly recognize the canon? Um, how can we, and further, how can we be confident that we individually can rightly recognize these three attributes of canonicity? And the answer is the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit on both the corporate and individual levels. The internal testimony of the Spirit's work um, is the work to overcome the effects of sin on our mind and lead us to recognize and believe that these books are from God. Paul writes in Romans 3 about the effects of sin on the mind and how people dead in their sins are unable to understand or seek God. In 1 Corinthians 2, 16 through 17, Paul 16, 6 through 16, excuse me, Paul tells of how the natural person is unable to understand the things of the Spirit of God. But speaking of Christians, he describes how he imparts to the Corinthians a secret and hidden wisdom of God in words taught by the Spirit. He says that we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. Even if you've never considered it, as a Christian who has received the Holy Spirit, you've been given a great gift to understand. Um, to understand, as Paul writes it, a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. So we trust God to expose his books to the church in the first place, and we trust the Holy Spirit to work in Christians individually and corporately to allow us to recognize the attributes of canonicity. Now, to be clear, this is not new personal revelation. He's not whispering in our ear a table of contents but rather allows us to recognize, that's a key word for tonight, recognize, the attributes of canonicity in God's books, leading us to believe that those books are from God. Okay, I've talked for long enough. I want to check over if there are any questions. Anything you guys want to clarify? Are we potentially running into a circularity problem as far as using... Scripture to look for the attributes we expect to find in Scripture, mm-hmm. and then look for those attributes. You could certainly contend that. Um, that's why I included the section from Hebrews about why I think it's appropriate as this highest authority of truth. How could you authenticate the highest authority of truth? If you authenticate it by something else, you make the other thing the highest authority of truth. Um, so. It's hard to go anywhere else with that. And I wanted to make the case that I think the Bible testifies that we can be confident in it, um, even though we have to do this self-authenticating thing. And I'll get into, as well, yeah, reasons why that process built up over time in a way that gives us maybe more confidence in it. Your internal testimony, before you finish, I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. Mm-hmm. guides us, lets us see what's in the text. 
Um, and that'll that'll probably be clearer too as we look at each of the each of the attributes of canonicity, how the Holy Spirit does that. Anything else? Yes, Katie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we'll dive into that with Second Peter especially. Second Peter is our example at the end, um, and it's one of the most, if not the most, contested book in the New Testament. Yes? How does this logic track for the Old Testament canon? For the Old Testament canon? Okay. Um, I think there are similar principles. Like, it's not apostolic origins, but it needs to be a legitimate prophet of God. Um, and the... Getting into the nitty-gritty about Old Testament canon and the disputes between different church traditions today about that is a lot about trying to understand um, what did early Christians think about each of these books and what was the Jewish canon at the time. Uh, it's a lot more historical investigation. Yeah, but I haven't dug into that nearly as much as I've looked at New Testament canon. But I'm still happy to talk about it if anybody's wondering. Okay, awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, and now I will move on to our first attribute of canonicity, the divine qualities of Scripture. When we consider divine qualities, do we find that our Bibles are rightly distinguished from the rest of history's books? Psalm 19.7 reads, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Recall also from Isaiah 55 earlier, it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So we see then, from these two example texts, that the canon's books must be perfect, beautiful, and virtuous. As God's word, they must be effective, reviving the soul, and accomplishing God's purpose. And their testimony must be sure, and it must make wise, um, being consistent and truthful. Unity is especially where we're going to look at. Um, so we can be more specific in our question. Are the books beautiful as if from God? Are they effective to accomplish God's purpose? And are they harmonious with one another, communicating God's truth in perfect unity? Now, some of these questions pertain to our personal experience of the scriptures. John 10, 27 records Jesus' words, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Relatedly, 10, 5 records, A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus' words here speak of the flock corporately, but also offer tremendous encouragement on the individual level. Um, I hope that you can already see and recall the divine qualities of Scripture, uh, the beautiful presentation of Christ's glory, the virtue in its words, and the effectiveness of Scripture in your own salvation and to guide the church. And further, the amazing agreement and harmony between the many books of our Bible. But... When you don't see these things, you doubt them, you wrestle with tensions in Scripture, I would encourage you towards faith with Jesus' promise that his sheep will hear his voice and confidence that the Spirit will lead you to see them more rightly as you grow in grace. But divine qualities are not merely an issue of individual experience. We can look to the church history and to the deliberations of those who first recognized the canon the leaders of the early church, who we call the church fathers, debated which books should be recognized as canon. Um, when they did so, they looked carefully at the divine qualities of the proposed books and urged for their canonicity on, in part on that basis. So the church fathers appealed to beauty in their deliberations. For example, Jerome um, argued that Philemon should be included in the canon by observing in it the beauty of the gospel as a mark of its inspiration. The church fathers also appealed to the power and efficacy of scripture. Irenaeus defended the fourfold gospel on the grounds that they are always breathing out immortality on every side and vivifying men afresh. Origen defended the gospels by declaring that the words of Jesus contained therein are accompanied with divine power that transforms its hearers in regard to their dispositions and their lives. Finally, the unity of scripture was a central attribute used to recognize the proper canonical books. The Moratorian canon list rejects one book on account of its heresy. But that might raise the question in your mind, and this is related to the circularity we were talking about earlier. Um, how could they know what doctrines were heresy and what doctrines were true without the New Testament? 
Now, for one, um, what might have come to mind for y'all is that they referenced the doctrines of the Old Testament. Uh, secondly, they had a canonical core. A, the books recognized their authority the earliest in the history of the church. This core included the four Gospels and a number of major epistles and served as a standard for orthodoxy. Thirdly, there existed this relationship of mutual confirmation between the oral tradition, which recorded the apostles' teaching, and the canonical books under consideration. These three sources helped Christians distinguish between God's word and merely human books, while God's word still acted as the perfect standard for the church. Okay. You guys have any questions? Does this seem like um, substantial, like a good reason to think that scripture, like these particular books are scripture? Yeah, the church as a whole. Um, and to be clear to when I use that term, I don't mean like one particular church institution, um, like the Southern Baptist Convention, like recognize these are the right books. I mean that Christians broadly, um, and not every Christian, but the church generally as a whole, recognize these books. Yes. Well, oh yeah, so the question is, a lot of times it's not really apparent to us that scripture has these divine qualities. Uh, it might seem to really be problematic. We might be having trouble seeing how um, something depicted in scripture is really moral or good or just. Um, I would say the most important thing with those considerations is to not become overwhelmed, not to see the, miss the tree for the forest to reverse the idiom, um, to really dig into the particular issue. But I think it's, it's also helpful to note that, and I meant to mention this earlier, these three attributes are reinforcing of one another. They're not totally inseparable. In order for a book to have divine qualities, it must come from God. And so if, we, if we're confident for other reasons, for church reception, for evidence of apostolic origins, that a book is from God, um, that gives the scripture the ability to augment our sense of morality. And scripture needs to have that authority to, to, for us to really be subject to it. It needs to be able to challenge us. Um, so these attributes are inter interacting and supporting one another. Like if a book came from an inspired apostle, then it's going to have these divine qualities. And if it came from an apostle and it had these divine qualities, it will surely impose itself on the church, and the church will accept it because the Holy Spirit's working in the church. Could I maybe add? Yeah. Would you agree that the fact that it doesn't, the Bible doesn't hide the flaws of a lot of the main characters is also a sign of its uh, historical accuracy and, mm. and also that Yeah. And I think it adds to the credibility of it that not every person in the Bible was a superman that never did anything wrong. It would be completely unbelievable. That's very true. And that's part of the whole biblical theme. It's especially hard in Old Testament narrative because it's not always stated like Abraham did this and he was really wrong to do that. Like it just says Abraham does it and then it traces the story. <laughs> what then? <laughs> Take the Embassy Gospel of Thomas, uh, <laughs> which portrays Jesus as like accidentally like killing someone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's embarrassing. <clears throat> I don't think it's necessarily uh, always a good 
good criterion for whether something is independent or not. Um, so I, I think it, 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 it's helpful, but maybe broadly should be nuanced a little bit. Yeah. Uh, what about the apocryphal books that are excluded by the church? Are they excluded on the basis of not having divine qualities or so uh, divine qualities are one of the three attributes. Oh, yeah. So about apocryphal books that the church has rejected, not included in the canon. Can I ask, are you talking about um, Old Testament Deuterocanon books? Okay, any of them. Um, so like for one of the examples I gave here that the Moratorian canon um, specifically rejects a book because of Marcionite heresy which is to say that it identifies that this book is laying out a theology that is not correct, and it rejects it on that basis. Um, and this was consistent. The church fathers did this and rejected books on this basis. Okay. Um, I don't want to run out of time, so I'm going to move on for now. Okay. So turning to our second attribute, when we consider apostolic origins, do we find that our Bibles are rightly distinguished from the rest of history's books? To understand the role of the apostles in the formation of the canon, let's first observe the covenantal nature of the canon. The Old Testament set the precedent that God would accomplish redemption through covenant. Simply put, a covenant is an arrangement or contract between two parties that includes the terms of their relationship, covenant obligations, and blessings and curses. In particular, as was historically standard for covenants between human parties, a written copy of the covenant would be provided. The Old Testament includes particular covenant documents and reflects covenant documents in its overall structure. So when Jesus brings in the new covenant, we expect a covenant document to outline the new relationship between God and his people. And then we turn to the question, how would that document be delivered? <coughs> God created the apostolic office to appoint, as Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 3.6, ministers of a new covenant. Sorry, past that. Um, apostle is a transliteration of the Greek apostolos, meaning literally one who is sent. In John 16.13, Jesus assured his disciples, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and will he will declare to you the things that are to come. This unique work of the Holy Spirit and the apostles enabled them to carry out their unique office. So, the apostles were appointed with a message, the good news of Jesus Christ, to proclaim to the church and the world. Now, at first, this apostolic message was transmitted by word of mouth. Paul writes of this standard apostolic tradition when he begins his testimony to the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 5, 15, 3. He's reciting this standard formula. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance to the scriptures. And he goes on. This oral transmission was the initial means of proclamation, but the apostolic message would be preserved by writing it down. So, we may be assured of a book's canonicity by observing that it was written under the purview of apostles. This means any book admitted to the canon must have been written in the apostolic era, and by an author, by an apostle himself, or by an author who received his information directly from an apostle. We can often observe this from the scriptures themselves because apostolic origins are one of the key ways that the New Testament authors claimed authority over the early church. Paul does this often, um, such as in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as, but as what it really is, the word of God which is at work in you believers. Further, in 2 Thessalonians 2.15, he makes clear that his written letters bear the same authority as his spoken word when he exhorts, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Luke, in his gospel, does not claim to be an apostle himself, but rather to have compiled a narrative of things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. Luke communicates that he wrote as influenced by <coughs> apostolic eyewitnesses to Christ's resurrection. Do you guys have any questions about apostolic origins? Yes, David. So how does this interact with the fact that we have absolutely no idea who wrote the book of Hebrews? 
Hebrews. Oh, okay. So I wrote, I mentioned under the purview of apostles, right? So there are, I mean, I can't give you a full answer because I haven't like read into it. But one thing that comes to mind um, is in the book of Hebrews, he talks, the author speaks about, um, sort of identifies himself as a second generation Christian, so to speak, learning from the very first generation. Um, you also see Timothy mentioned at the end of the letter. So I take those things as an indication that the author of Hebrews was in a fellowship with, then we know, of course, Timothy was in very close fellowship with Paul. I take that as an indication that the author of Hebrews was in fellowship with this critical apostolic, the people of this apostolic office. Yeah. If we can get through like once removed, then that also justifies several other books that are not. Well, yeah, but that's not our only that's not our only restriction. Um, is it more like it's said like a tenant because I yeah. I heard that. Um it's kind of like it seems like a case. It yeah, be, yeah. It just can't do it just can't be one criteria. Yeah. It's it's almost like a it's a package. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't recall. Yeah. Well, I don't know if that's true, because I know it was pretty common use in teaching. Um, and it's, First Clement is one of those books that through the development of the canon, the church fathers like had a pretty positive regard for it. They were like, this is a good book. This is good for learning. It's good for teaching. These people can give us good examples of what it's like to live as a Christian um, while still deciding not to include it in the canon. Um, that's where a place where a lot of nuance comes into this study and something that maybe we've lost nowadays is we want books to be in the Bible and perfect or we never want to look at them. And the church fathers had a lot higher regard for some of the books that they didn't include in the canon. Okay. Last category. Last attribute of canonicity. When we consider corp corporate church reception, do we find that our Bibles are rightly distinguished from the rest of history's books? There did exist in the early church, and still exists today, some, you mentioned the Ethiopian <laughs> canon, some disagreement about what books should be canonical. In order to defend corporate reception as a legitimate means of recognizing which books are from God, we need to evaluate if this disagreement ex exceeds the expectations of Scripture of the self-authenticating model. Then we may consider the church's reception of various books in conjunction with divine qualities and apostolicity of those books to be assured of what books should be regarded as canon. Now, disagreement in the early church is expected to some degree because it's anticipated by Scripture itself. Scripture warns of false teachers, describes the opposition of spiritual forces, and details how believers can resist the Spirit in their sin, working against his internal testimony, and warns how, of how unbelievers will be present in the church. These things mean, one, that genuine believers may have been mistaken about the canon, and two, that falsely, believe, falsely professing believers plausibly would have cont sorry, contended for the wrong canon, obstructing the testimony of the true church. Like, we look back at these old documents, we don't know whether these people are genuine Christians, and they're affirming a different canon. Thirdly, since God delivered his word, and this one's very critical, since God delivered his word through normal historical channels, like letters sent out, copied, and recognized by gradual discernment of the church fathers, we expect this gradual recognition of the canon. And so disagreement about the canon in the early church, and even to some degree in the modern church, is no indication that the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit has failed to lead Christians into a right recognition of the canon. The internal testimony of the Holy Spirit was effective to guide the early church into a consensus 
about a canonical core. I mentioned this earlier. Earlier than in history, then the boundaries of the canon were solidified. There was still this fuzziness when the church had come to a consensus on a core of books. The earliest evidence that Christians regarded the New Testament books, regarded some of the New Testament books as scripture is found in scripture itself. 2 Peter 3.16 categorizes Paul's letters alongside the other scriptures. Given Peter's claim to apostolic authority at the beginning of the letter, this reference begins to indicate that Christians from the earliest era regarded the apostles' letters as having scriptural authority. Further, when the epistles reference the Gospels, as 1 Timothy 5.18 appears to do, even calling it scripture, we may realize that the earliest Christians regarded the Gospel accounts as scripture. In 2 Peter 3.2, Peter reminds his audience to remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, that they may trustingly anticipate the day of the Lord. The phrase, the predictions of the holy prophets, corresponds to the Old Testament. And so the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles seems to subtly anticipate a parallel New Testament. The public reading of scripture and synagogue worship was normal in first century Jewish context. And so the fact that some of Paul's epistles and Revelation prescribe and expect their public reading indicates that they were regarded with significant authority. For example, in Colossians 4.16, Paul wrote, And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and see to it, see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. Okay. Now, unfortunately, lacking time to dive into a historical investigation of the reception of the canon in the later church after the era of the apostles and the I'll offer some summary. So by the middle of the second century, Christians had widely recognized this core New Testament canon. This included the four gospels, Paul's epistles, Acts, 1 Peter, 1 John, and perhaps others. The boundaries of the canon were still fuzzy. There were ongoing discussions about books like 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, and Revelation. And apocryphal books that would eventually be omitted still played an active role in certain portions of the church, like 1 Clement, as I mentioned. Nevertheless, further deliberations would occur with the canonical foundation laid. The canonical direction was set. The doctrinal direction was set. Um, And additionally, even though debate would continue for a couple centuries, when the dust settled, the churches, I would argue, reached a very impressive degree of agreement about the New Testament canon and which books it recognized as speaking with the voice of its master. And indeed, this eventual unity, even though it's later, shouldn't be neglected as an assurance that Christ himself was indeed speaking through these New Testament books. Okay, so do you guys have any questions about corporate reception as a means of authenticating the canon? So on a more modern note, right, so how should we approach texts that are generally considered useful according to church tradition but not necessarily divine by canonicity standards, Mm -hmm. right? For example, something by, like, St. Paul, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's like that the letter that was written to churches was disseminated, uh, but not necessarily, you know, important enough to be, you know, canonized, right? So how should we approach texts like that, understanding that they were written with scriptural intent and not viewed as such to be canonized? Um, so you said at the end, written with scriptural intent. I would hesitate to say that, because I think some of the church fathers you see in these books that were eventually rejected... Um, I don't remember what book it is, but, the, but there's one famous one where they say, like, I do not address you as Paul did, um, for I am but a sinner. Um, and, they, I mean, this is a very, very significant bishop speaking. Um, so they kind of recognize that they didn't have the same authority. Um, but to answer your actual question, I think we should follow suit with how the church fathers regarded these books and read them. Um, yeah, that's, that's something I've been thinking about. So I did this presentation a few months ago, and then I kind of updated it and revamped it recently. So as, as I've been going through it again, that's occurred to me. Like, 
the Church Fathers really did have regard for some books that were left out of the canon. And I think just because they were omitted doesn't mean that we should completely forget about them. Yeah? By Church Fathers, do you mean the people who found the Church or the people who wrote the Scripture? Oh, yeah, sorry. I thought I def defined that. So Church Father just means like um, a leader in the early Church. So these are men whose writings we have recorded and they're very helpful for indicating to us the theology of the early church, how it developed over time. Okay. Yeah. As distinguished from the apostles. Yes, yes, as distinguished from the apostles. So I don't mean the people who actually wrote the scriptures. Yeah. So they, and they're divided into groups. So the apostolic fathers are the people immediately following the era of the apostles. Um, and then there's other groups after that. Okay, awesome. So we have, we have the model completely down. We can apply it to Second Peter as experts in canon. And so to ground the model in practical application, let's conduct a short, superficial case study on Second Peter. As I mentioned, this epistle is one of the most contested books of the New Testament for reasons we'll see as we apply the model. Uh, the format I'm going for here is I'm going to give you a bunch of like critical facts and then we can discuss whether or not we think these are sufficient, whether we can have confidence in Second Peter in light of these. And we'll do that for each attribute. So one reason for Second Peter's contested status is a slow process of reception by the early church. It was omitted from the Morientorian fragment that I mentioned earlier, our earliest canonical list, and the testimony of Origen and Eusebius indicate that some had concerns about the book from the second century. On. Even Jerome, who advocated for its canonicity, recognized a significant stylistic divergence from 1 Peter, a difference that has led historical critical scholars to deny its authorship today. They say that it was certainly not written by Peter because it deviates, or for one reason, because it deviates from 1 Peter so much in its style. However, the reality is that 2 Peter was ultimately recognized as canonical with clarity by the 4th century church fathers and councils. Councils are um, convocations of leaders of the early church. All these leaders got together and made like, very significant decisions. Yeah? I think these were not ecumenical councils. I, have, I omitted the names of them, sorry, and I don't recall them. Um, further, connections to 2 Peter in other early texts make first century of authorship of 2 Peter totally plausible. These include allusions by church fathers in the 2nd century um, with liter and literary dependence of the apocryphal Apocalypse of Peter. So it was written by not Peter, but he like, copied stuff from 2 Peter and, and shared references with 1 Clement. Now you could argue that these uh, allusions go the other way around. Um, but we do have a number of examples. So these indicate it's very plausible that it was actually written in Peter's lifetime. So do you, do you guys think this is a sufficient degree of church reception? Like, is this problematic? It wasn't until the 4th century that it was super clear. You don't like it? <laughs> yeah. I'm confused why this is even a problem. Doesn't the fact that First Peter is called First Peter at least imply because it's still the second? <laughs> <laughs> wow. I don't see the issue here. That's an excellent point, Sam. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. You go ahead. So I'm just, I guess I'm just kind of curious. Like, how, like, having these old, like, 400 people, or, like, these people who live in this time making these decisions, how can they go from, oh, like, we don't even know who this author is, the style is so different, like, it's not part of the canon, like, don't regard it as that, to, oh, it was written in Peter's lifetime, blah, 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 therefore it's mm. how we agree. To so, so, make that. All, all this, like, literary dependent stuff is more modern considerations. Um, modern considerations. Well, I don't know. Maybe, actually, I probably should not say that because I don't know, but... I don't know when, when those like, literary dependencies were observed. But maybe I overstated the degree to which people were concerned about Second Peter early on. Um, it's also just important to remember that they didn't have the internet back then. Yes. So, like, Origen was not talking to Greece all the time. 
<laughs> yeah. So I, I forget whether it was Origin or Eusebius, but one of them, like, he indicated that he had concerns about it, but he advocated for it. He thought it was canonical. Um, so it's not like they were saying, nobody really trusts this book, but we still have it. And then, like, in the fourth century, they decided, ah, it's okay. Like, it was, it was legitimately contested. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, just to make sure I understand the third bullet point, the Apocalypse of Peter is, is dated to 110. Yes. And the argument is that it depends on Second Peter? Uh, yes. There, Peter there's evidence of an illusion. Okay. I wouldn't say it has to. Like, you could contend that Second Peter was written later and it copied Apocalypse of Peter. Um, but with... Huh? I think you meant to say. Oh, you could argue that Second Peter was written later and depended on the Apocalypse of Peter. But um, having an, a number of illusions strengthens the argument that Second Peter was written sooner. Okay. I guess I would ask the question of when the other books that were the, like, being discussed, like Second and Third John and Revelation, when they were recognized. By um, I don't remember exactly. The, Consensus was reached in the fourth century. Okay. Yeah. And that's actually something important to note. There, there are some doctrines that, um, like the divinity of Christ, that were very clearly um, marked by an ecumenical council, a huge number of church leaders coming and agreeing, making this declaration. The canon is not that way. Um, you don't see ecumenical council until quite a while later. So, I mentioned a moment ago, well, more than a moment now, uh, <laughs> that historical critical consensus is that Second Peter was not authored by the apostle himself. One contributing factor for that assertion is that it deviates too far from First Peter in its literary style. For example, a lack of shared words is noted, as well as a lack of formal Old Testament quotes. A lot of this is things that um, we wouldn't notice in English. Um, it's more in the Greek, the grammar, the word choices. However, um, Dr. Kruger gave some examples that the word count comparison, for example, is not actually that remarkable um, compared to other books that are related to one another. And a difference in style could be explained in multiple ways. An uh, early church father thought that Peter was having somebody else write down the letter for him, and he was guiding them to write, and that he used somebody different for Second Peter. But it could also be explained by difference in purpose of the book, to encourage a persecuted church versus to warn a church afflicted by church father, uh, false teachers. <laughs> Additionally, upon closer inspection, a tremendous number of parallels can be drawn between the two books, including, funnily enough, the Old Testament quotes um, are, include particularly Psalms, Proverbs, and Isaiah in both 1 Peter and 2 Peter. Do you guys think that this set of data is sufficient evidence for the apostolic origins of this book? Or is this too dicey? Uh, That's a really good thing to bring up. Um, there's this term, pseudepigraphy, that it, which is to mean someone else wrote under the name of Peter. This is what historical critical scholars are saying Second Peter is. Um, many people trying to maintain the authority of Second Peter will say that the author used this as a literary device. He didn't intend to deceive anybody. This was understood at the time. And so we can still interpret the book as speaking with authority. The it problem... It comes from the fact that Second Peter claims to be by Peter. Uh, it opens with saying, oh, I'm Simon Peter writing this letter. Yeah. So Funnily enough, Simeon Peter, too. Which is a, that's a, one issue that's brought up, is it's a, kind of a rare form of the name. It's a different form than he uses in First Peter. Actually, I'm not sure if he uses Simon in First Peter. But anyway, sorry. So, I don't think that works. 
because the way that the church fathers verify these books is by saying this, it was written by an apostle, so it bears apostolic authority. And they're very clear, they're books that they rejected because they claimed to be written by apostle and were not. So in the mind of the church fathers, this was not an acceptable literary device. And so it's, I would argue, anachronistic. Uh, it's not appropriate to the time for us to say pseudepigraphy was an acceptable literary device um, because the church fathers didn't seem to think so immediately following the authorship of these books. Katie, you look like you disagree. Oh, oh. And so I don't know that if, they're like, for example, if Peter's saying this book, but somebody else is writing that, it. Yeah, sorry, that's not what I'm talking about. That's called the amanuesis. I don't know if I'm saying that right. It's, that's having someone else write down a book. You're guiding them to write down that book. Well, pseudepigraphy is someone completely unrelated to Peter writing a book as Peter. And people say, oh, they're just using it as a literary device. The church fathers seem to think, no, it's, that's forgery. You can't do that. I mean, it seems like it's, it, it's hard to maybe sometimes distinguish between the two bigger pieces. And I, I don't even know how you can do it exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's, it could, different words have a different word choice and ways of writing it could be due to somebody writing it, like as Peter 16. Mm, yeah, it. yeah, that's, and one of, the, one of the church fathers said 2 Peter's different because it was a, diff, it was a different amanuensis than 1 Peter. Yes, Zach. So First Peter ends with, I Silva or, uh, by Sylvanus, I have written this letter to you. So the, the claim is, it opens up with, I'm Peter, blah, 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 blah. Thanks, Sylvanus, he, he did all the writing for me. So the, uh, but pseudepigraphy would be, I'm pretending to be Peter, but I'm going to claim that I'm Peter, blah, 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 blah. Oh, and then also Sylvanus did all the writing for me. Does that help? Okay, yeah. Was the book of Enoch also pseudepigraphy? Yes. Yeah, and that's a chief example because it's um, clearly dated way, way, way after Enoch is alleged. <sighs> so just uh, even so, even though most historians agree that it, Second Peter was pseudepigraphy, like some guy yeah. unrelated to Peter wrote it as Peter. Mm -hmm. Even though historians agree that, like, like why do they still think that's like it's still okay to be canon? I guess. Like, uh, it's well. A lot of the people that say that it wasn't written by Peter aren't Christians, uh, and so that's not a concern for them. Okay. It's, it's kind of interesting. It's rather surprising if you're not familiar with um, New Testament scholarship, but there are a lot of people who are New Testament scholars who are not Christians. So it's those people that think it's... I mean, well, there... I can't name an example, but I'm also sure there are Christians who say that it was not, and they try to maintain its authority by saying things like, Pseudepigraphy was a literary device. Okay. Yeah. All right. So finally, oh, sorry, go ahead. Is it out of the realm of possibility to consider that Peter just had an up and change in like, the way he decided to write this, this particular letter? I mean, Michael. So um, the way you would guess that is by actually looking at the Greek and the way that the reason why people think that the change in word choice in first Peter to second Peter is not just the guy using different words, is that first Peter is very fluent, very competent Greek. Second Peter looks like it was written by a Jewish fisherman. Who doesn't speak Greek. So the idea is why on earth would this guy get worse at his Greek over time and why? It's not even close. First Peter has some of the best Greek in the New Testament. Second Peter is the worst Greek in the New Testament. And so that's the that's the claim that critical scholars are making is this this is why the change in wording is so drastic. It's because Second Peter has really bad Greek. Thank you, Michael. A resident Greek expert. <laughs> yes, Sam. That makes more sense, what he just said, if First Peter's using the Manuensis and Second Peter's not using the Manuensis. Uh, that seems like a pretty... Mm. Because Peter 
Was he a Jewish fisherman? Is that what you were getting at, Michael, when you said that? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll admit, um, so I read an article by, or maybe more <laughs> rightly said, a paper by Michael Kruger um, in defense of Second Peter, but he was sort of speaking in context of this corpus of literature criticizing it, so he didn't dive so much into the criticism. Um, so I honestly can't, I wasn't, I don't think I can really represent the critical arguments very well. Yes, Landry. Are there any Christians who would bite the bullet and say that we should get rid of Second Peter from the canon? John Calvin. Really? Yeah, really. Apparently John Calvin. That's tough. First John Calvin L. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And let's stick with what we know are the core, you know, if if you're are, if you're arguing with someone that, that doesn't believe the Bible has divine authority and you're using scripture as you would any other um, primary document, primary eyewitness, then you would do well to use books that historical criticism has been more kind to. Um, books like the Four Gospels. Um, now, that's not to say that like, I think that all the historical critical criticisms are correct, but if you're engaging with someone who's very skeptical, then you can use common ground to make an argument. OK, we have four minutes, so I'm going to zoom. Oh, Three after, minutes. after, at your play. Oh, okay, so some more complex critiques of Second Peter's content are also made on a theological basis beyond a stylistic one. Um, it's purported that it problematically lacks mention of the cross of Christ, exhibits a manward-oriented theology of salvation and end times, and especially has highlighted the purpose of being partakers of the divine nature from chapter 1, verse 4, with Christ's transfiguration alleged as a prototype of this process. However, references to being cleansed from his former sins and to the master who bought them presuppose the cross of Christ as background for the author's exhortations. And in reality, 2 Peter very well reflects the New Testament themes of the way, salvation accomplished already but not yet, and Christ's imminent return as a motivation for holy living. In conclusion... Um, Second Peter was ultimately recognized by the 4th century church fathers and councils and plausibly written in Peter's lifetime by the apostle as shown by early literary connections to the epistle. Further, Second Peter is clearly in unity with the Bible in its theology of salvation and the end times. All things considered, we have good reason to believe that the Spirit was at work in guiding the church to accept Second Peter and that the epistle is inspired by God. To recap our whole discussion today, we are right to be confident that the Bible is from God, and it is a joy to have that assurance. <clears throat> because God desires to equip us for every good work through Scripture, we can be confident that God has providentially ensured that the books he in inspired for our edification were exposed to the church more broadly. Because the Holy Spirit worked in the church, overcoming the effects of sin on our minds, we are led to recognize the attributes of Scripture that indicate its canonicity, namely its divine qualities, its apostolic origins, and its corporate reception. In John 10, 27 through 30, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Thank you all.